Thank you, Greg. <clears throat> I was in Texas last week, and I was reminded that uh, Texas is a foreign country. Actually, Texas is Texas, and everything outside of its border is a foreign country. I married a Texican, and uh, the worst thing about that is you also get a mother-in-law who is a Texican, and they do tell tall tales. One of my wife's relatives were having a little problem with uh, one of their children about exaggerating too much. I mean, even for a Texan, he was exaggerating too much. And she talked with the teacher about it. The teacher said, well, let's go down to the principal. He's had some experience and been successful in correcting these problems in the past. They called the principal, told him what the situation was, and he asked him to bring the boy down. And he got little Johnny in there and said, now, Johnny, <clears throat> If I told you I caught 200 bass in 10 minutes, and the largest one was 80 pounds, and I would have caught one larger than that, except as I had him on and fighting him, this giant shadow came over me. I looked, and it was this big grizzly bear. I mean, a huge grizzly bear. I mean, this was a monster. This bear weighed 4,000 pounds. He started chasing me, and I ran and fell in a hole and stumbled, and just as the bear was about to get me, a little dog came out of the woods. I mean a little dog. This was a tiny dog. This dog didn't weigh but two pounds. And jumped on that bear and caught him by the throat, cut his jugular vein, and the bear died and saved my life. He said, now, if I told you that story, I would lose all credibility, and you wouldn't believe a word of it. He said, yes, I would, too, Principal. That's my dog. <laughs> and would you believe that's the second grizzly he's killed this month? The only way I can bring those Texans back down to earth is to remind them if the Alamo had had a back door, there wouldn't be a Texas. <laughs> History does not repeat itself. Human nature repeats itself. It is the nature of humans to forget, and they need to be reminded, to stray from the straight and narrow to sin and back again from peace to war and back again, from poverty to prosperity and back to poverty again. This cycle of human nature is going on in the people and in their leaders simultaneously. Sometimes the people are wrong, sometimes the leadership is wrong, sometimes both of them are wrong. Among the earliest documents in recorded history the religious leaders in Egypt admonishing their people to turn thou back, to go back to the founding principles, to re-embrace what made their religion uh, acceptable to them in the beginning. I'll tell you a couple of quick stories from history that illustrate something about human nature. Uh, <clears throat> Babylon fell the first time because Cyrus diverted the, the great Persian, diverted the flow of the river. It, set, it fell the second time with who his grandson, Darius, through an interesting set of facts. And I won't give you all the details, but I recommend this story to you because the details are fascinating. But his commander of his army, Zopirus, had been down there, laid siege to Babylon when they rebelled for 20 months and couldn't do anything. Everything they tried wouldn't work. So finally, <clears throat> Uh, the Babylonians said, y'all might as well go home. Uh, uh, mules will fall before Babylon falls. Now, for those of you who didn't grow up on a farm, mules are hybrids, and they don't have, they don't reproduce, they don't have. <laughs> but Zephyrus was down in his stables one day, and lo and behold, one of his sumpter mules did bring foal. Happens about once every two million chances. Uh, so he took that as an omen, and he... Side. How, how can I then use this to go forward? So what he did <clears throat> was cut his nose off, cut his ears off, cut all of his hair off, had his soldiers beat him with a scourge where he was bloody and the flesh was hanging from him, and he went in to see the king and said, and the king said, my Lord, who did this to you? And he said, I did it to myself. He said, why? Because he said, I'm going to make Babylon fall. He said, man, they're not going to quit because you mutilate yourself. He said, no, I'm going to go down there, and I'm going to tell them you did this to me. And I'm going to tell them you did this to me because I said our efforts here were fruitless and we might as well go home. And he said, <clears throat> ten days after I'm there, I, I mean, I will tell them that I, I know all your counsels, and I'm going to ask them 
to get, put me in command of a body of troops so that I can get even. Now, ten days after I'm there, I want you to send a thousand men to point A, and I'm going to go out and kill every one of them. Seven days after that, I want you to put 2,000 men at point B, and I'm going to go out and kill every one of them. And uh, <clears throat> 20 days after that, I want you to put 4,000 men at point C, and I'm going to go out and kill every one of them. The Babylonians will be so happy, they'll make me commander-in-chief of their own army, and during the celebration, I will open the gates, and you will bring your army in, and we will capture Babylon. Long story short, that is precisely what happened. Now, old Zopirus, he understood human nature, and he won. In another part of the world at a different time, a Chinese emperor was having trouble with his army against his enemy. His enemy was Pang Chong, and old Pang Chong was a tough hammer knocker. And he was whipping the emperor's army every time he turned around. And he had to replace his commanding general. And he brought Sun Pin in, made him commanding general. Sun Pin called all his staff together, and I said, now, we got to list our weaknesses and our strengths. What is the strength of this army? And his commanders told the general, the only thing this army is noted for is cowardice. We're a bunch of cowards. Some men said, boy, it's not much to work with, but if that's what we got, we'll work with it. He said, here's our plan. I want 100,000 campfires lit tonight, 50,000 tomorrow night and 20,000 the night after that. Old Pang Chan will think our army is deserting and he will, he will chase us even, even more so. You know, the fake retreat is the oldest ruse in, in, in military strategy. He said, on the fourth day, I want us to get to the pass in the mountains. I want our army to get there late afternoon. I want it time so his scouts get there right at twilight and I want Pang Chan's army to get there at dark. All of that happened. Old Pang Chong was in hot pursuit. They got to the mountain pass. Sun Pen took a bunch of bow and arrow men and put them, hit them in the rocks over there. And he said, now this tree right here, tonight there will be a light come under this tree. When you see that light, I want you to shoot every, every arrow you have. And we will kill old Pang Chong. And his army will be demoralized and go into confusion and retreat and we will win. Sure enough, it happened exactly that way. <clears throat> he, he hid the, the archers in the rocks. He went down to that tree and stripped all the bark off of that tree and wrote a message on the tree. That night, a light came on that tree. They shot the arrows. They killed Pang John. His army did go into uh, retreat and confusion, and Sun Pen won. You know what the message was on the tree? The message was, under this tree, this day, Pang Chong shall die. And he did die. Now, old Sun Pen, he understood human nature, and he won. When the leaders of a government do not understand human nature, they develop bad policy. Bad policy has consequences. The people suffer. I read not long ago where this gentleman was espousing that Vietnam was the first war that the United States of America lost. I submit to you that he was wrong. Losing a war is when your country is invaded, your institutions are changed, your people are violated, and your property is confiscated. Now, that did not happen to us in the Vietnam War. It is true we may not have achieved some of our political objectives. We did achieve all the military objectives. But it clearly didn't lose the war and have our <coughs> our country invaded and our property confiscated. But half of the United States has had that happen to them. And the war between the states or the war of Southern independence. The country was invaded illegally, I might add. And <clears throat> for those of you still fighting the war, uh, <clears throat> the institutions were changed and the people were violated and the property was confiscated and the people suffered. The people suffered mightily. When this country was founded, we were blessed with noble leadership. During that war, we had unyielding passion on both sides, and we were blessed with poor policy, north and south, and the people suffered. My great-grandfathers and great-grandfather fought in that war. One from Montgomery, Alabama, uh, Montgomery County, Georgia, 
was a doctor and served in the Confederate Army in the Battle of Atlanta here in this city. And for those who were there, the memory that would haunt them the rest of their life, the one thing of all the horrors of the war that they could not get out of that, their mind was that mountain of arms and legs outside of the hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. Bad policy causes the people to suffer. It was a great tragedy for the American people. Hundreds of thousands were killed, millions were wounded, and tens of millions suffered hardship. It took this country at least 100 years to overcome it. Bad policy causes people to suffer. Now, our founding fathers understood this. They understood human nature. They understood that incentives matter. And they knew the lessons from history, the lessons that government destroys wealth and liberty, the lessons that when responsible citizens seek security more than liberty, they lose both, that when people eat their seed corn, they starve. And when citizens become dependent rather than independent, they're more suitable for slavery than they are citizenship and that there are no increases in standard of living without increases in productivity. And that excessive regulations stifle productivity and it hurts the standard of living. Excessive regulations eliminates creativity and innovations. Out of that come increase in productivity and out of that comes standard of living. So it is the consumer that pays for excessive regulations. We may think it is the businessman, and he does pay for it, but it's ultimately the consumer and therefore all of society. Accordingly, they did, uh, the, our founding fathers adopted these principles, that the government would serve the people. Now, we hear that all the time today, and we tend to take it for granted. But in all the governments, and all the civilizations since the beginning of time, that was an original thought. And all the rest of the time, the people serve the government, either the king or the church or the dictator or whatever. In this country, the government is here to serve the people. That we would have the rule of law. No man would be above another. That everybody would have a trial by a jury of their peers, and you were innocent until proven guilt. That we would have, based on these lessons from history, limited government with checks and balances that we would have individual, personal, political freedoms and individual responsibilities, and that we would have a free enterprise, incentive-based, market-oriented economy, or if you will, as Margaret Thatcher calls it, economic democracy to go with our political democracy. <clears throat> These concepts gave us the world's greatest economy, with the highest level of productivity and the greatest standard of living the world had ever known, America became the wealthiest and freest nation on the face of the earth. So much so that I think any objective historian will say that this past century was an American century, or this century that we're about to end. It was an American century. We faced World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, outer space, the threat of nuclear war, the Cold War. I mean, it was Russia against the United States. It was free enterprise against socialism. And we won. It was, without question, an American century. The question is, will the next century be an American century? We have... <clears throat> A lot of ways to destroy a nation, war is just one of them. Misguided policy will do just as well. Confiscatory taxation and excessive regulations will do the job just as neatly. I read just the other day where the Clinton administration has now exceeded the Carter administration, who did hold the record for the greatest number of regulations issued. We have <clears throat> tax system that punishes the producer 
and rewards the non-producer. Now, Russia, uh, Ludwig von Mises, the great Austrian uh, school of economics professor, studied socialism, and he said Russia wouldn't make it. He said they would fail. He said so socialism was fatally flawed because it was contrary to human nature. It wouldn't work. Russia subsidized inefficiency. They developed a something for nothing mentality. And they were plagued with absenteeism and alcoholism. Their economy became grossly inefficient and they lost. We won. We won partly because of our strengths and partly because of their weaknesses. But we paid a price to win. We have a large central government that we did not have when this century began. We have a tax system that feeds this government. It is so great that thanks to the tax foundation, we are now aware that the middle class, the average typical family pays more for taxes than they do for housing, food, and clothing combined. Outrageous. That the government sector of our economy is greater than the manufacturing economy. That the United States Department of Agriculture is larger than the United States Marine Corps. I mean, the United States Marine Corps, is there nothing sacred? <laughs> the first casualty on the list of winning that war was limited government. We lost the concept of limited government. You talk to people about it today, their eyes glows over. They don't have any, uh, any idea what you're talking about. We were so focused on winning the nuclear war, we are about to lose the economic war. We have the world's largest economy and the majority of the citizens living in this country don't have a clue as to how we got there. We are economically ignorant. Can we maintain this economy with that, with that uh, uh, basis? We lost a sense of individual responsibility. And between welfare and outrageous settlements from trial lawyers and lotteries from our states, we too are developing a something for nothing attitude. We too are subsidizing inefficiency. Now, we're not dumb enough to do it in the name of the state or equality. No, no, no. We do it in the name of compassion. But is anybody in the room who thinks the results will be any different? There are people today who would have you believe that mothers can't raise children, that farmers can't farm, and that educators cannot teach without a monthly check from the federal government. I do not care how many times you use the word compassion in a speech on the floor of the United States Congress. You do no man a service to make him dependent. Now, my first Sunday school teacher was my mother, and I'm a Sunday school teacher myself, and I understand and believe in the concept of charity. And I think institutionally and individually, we ought to do all that we can for those who cannot. But this business of doing for people who will not is wrong. It's wrong for the producers, it's wrong for them, it's wrong for society as a whole. The wisdom of the ages has come down from, uh, to us, from the sage Confucius to the prophet Ezekiel to the economist Adam Smith to the historian Arnold Toynbee. All have warned us about the dangers of relying on someone else for your well-being as opposed to your own individual responsibility. Now, these attitudes have given us a litany of problems. As if <clears throat> fire ants and armadillos and coyotes wasn't enough to worry about, we also have the problem of this welfare mess and uh, <clears throat> an out-of-control spending and a budget deficit. We have had no real growth in the standard of living for the middle class in the last 20 years. We've lost two-thirds of the value of the dollar against the mark and the yen in the last quarter century. We have, 
a something for nothing attitude. It stems in large part from our income tax system. Let me give you two examples. In Kentucky now, when uh, a fellow gets married, he does these things. He buys him a house trailer and gets a disability insurance on it. He buys him a pickup truck and gets disability insurance on that, and he files him a workman's comp claim. He has a mysterious back problem. So that his, his, his trailer payments are, paid, um, are made, his truck payments are made, he spends a year hunting and fishing. It's a something for nothing mentality. Now, lest you think that's only at the entry level, last year when health care reform was the big news and going through, the Paul Revere Insurance Company, which uh, a large part of their business is insuring medical doctors for disability, had an absolute, absolute epidemic of doctors who applied for disability. And of course, getting a second opinion was no problem at all. They could get a hundred second opinions. It's a something for nothing mentality. The income tax is an idea whose time has come and gone. It is counterproductive to anybody who has to compete in the world. It <coughs> is biased against the honest. It's biased against the legal system. The underground economy does not pay taxes. It's biased against the domestic manufacturer as opposed to a foreign company. It wastes some of the best brain power in America. It is anti-incentive and it does not impact our competition. Now, whether you're in the United States government or the state of Georgia government, you can pass all the tax increases you want to and all the regulations you want to, but they do not impact our competitors. And who pays for that? The consumer and society. <clears throat> There are, I think the, the income tax needs to be eliminated. I don't think that's about to, to happen, but it is counterproductive. It does need to be eliminated. But I do think there is perhaps a chance that there's a step in between eliminating it that we can go to this flat tax that's been suggested. And the flat tax does help business address the problem of savings, investment, research and development, and productivity increases. Now, one thing is clear, we can't maintain the status quo. The competitive situation has increased and we're going to have to compete or see our standard of living go down to comparable to a third world country. Uh, status quo reminds me of the comment that Ronald Reagan said about status quo. He said, uh, status quo, status quo, that's Latin for the mess we're in. Now, unless we think all our problems are in Washington, we got plenty right here in the state of Georgia. We have record number of people on welfare and food stamps, and yet you can hardly go anywhere in the state that you don't see signs say, now hiring, applications taken, uh, help wanted. Every supermarket, every restaurant you go into, every convenience store, every department store, lots of manufacturers have this. Well, some people say, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't want a minimum wage job. I don't either. But I have had one. But they don't understand that minimum wage job is the entry level to get you in. And then through either formal education for you students in the room or on the job training, you move up higher. You make yourself absolutely invaluable to your employer. And that's how you get away from the minim minimum wage pay. We have five plants in the state and two more under construction and thousands of employees in Georgia. And every year, the <coughs> school tax part of the ad valorem taxes go up. And every year we see where the results in our school system diminish. So we got a problem. We're not only turning out the students that we need to turn out, we're getting our tax base high so that becomes a cost to the businessman, and it m diminishes their ability to compete. The next war has already started. It's not a fighting war with bombs and bullets. It's an economic war. Whether we like it or not, we're in a global economy. 
And this time, it's not going to be our free enterprise system competing against some dictatorship or some socialist system. This time, it's going to be our free enterprise system competing against their free enterprise system. Georgia, we need to be aware. In the past, people have tended to look for a job where they lived. In the future, they're going to live where they can find the job that suits them. Georgia, we need to be careful that we don't have a brain drain out of our state, people going other places. We've got <clears throat> an attitude or an arrogant situation with some members of our state legislature that won't even let the people of Georgia vote on term limitations or public initiative referendums. Some members of our state legislature were so busy fighting yesteryear's war, they let the big bank financial center wind up in Charlotte rather than Atlanta. We got a problem in Georgia in that the state spending has grown faster even than the United States government. I mean, now, if you can outspend the U.S. Congress, that is some testimonial. We've got a problem, <clears throat> and yet we've got an opportunity. I think this block grant challenge that we're going to have in front of us gives Georgia the opportunity to re-engineer its government, not unlike so many businesses are having to re-engineer themselves today. The world is changing. Government must change also. I think we will have an opportunity, unlike anything in my lifetime, to really take a hard look at what we're doing and ask ourselves the hard questions. Is it really in our best interest of our people for the future? In this global challenge, the time will come when governments will be every bit as concerned about capital formation and capital allocation and capital recovery as business managers are. Those countries working in concert with their industry will be a formidable competitive force as opposed to this country where we have had an adversarial relationship between government and business. The world has changed, and if we do not recognize it and change with it, our standard of living will surely diminish. Still, when you look around, I'm encouraged. President Clinton was elected two years ago, and he said it was because the people wanted change. The Republicans went into office last November, and they said it was because people wanted change. That's good news. That is encouraging. We need to change. I'm encouraged because companies like my company, Flowers Industries, are getting more involved in the political process. Individuals, I see more and more individuals getting involved in the political process. And somebody told me the other day, said, Amos, you really have a passion for politics, don't you? I said, no, I do not. I have a passion for my company, for Flowers Industries and the chance to build it into the great business enterprise that I think it can be. Politics is a duty. It's a duty that all of us must address. I'm encouraged because I see the work of people like the Tax Foundation. And I'm encouraged because there's a new organization in our state called the Georgia Public Policy Foundation. And uh, Hank McCamish, started this, and the people of Georgia are going to be indebted to this man. I am honored by my association with this organization. I believe it has the potential to make the greatest difference for the people of this state than any vehicles out there today. It has already made a difference, and we are held in high esteem by the Georgia State Legislature on both sides of the aisle for the work that we do. Now, Georgia Public Policy Foundation and studying the issues to illuminate and educate the people and the legislators are going to make a difference.
And so here we are, two centuries and two decades after our founding fathers, facing the same problems, but with the same hope in our hearts and the same prayer on our lips. Our fathers, God, to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God our King. I commend the Tax Foundation and Georgia Public Policy Foundation for its work. I wish you <clears throat> good luck and Godspeed on your seminar today. And ladies and gentlemen, for your kind attention, I thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. McMillan has agreed to answer any questions, uh, at least as long as we don't go too long with them, uh, that you might have. Thank you, J.D. I, uh, I'm going to have to leave right after this. We've got a board of directors meeting in Atlanta, and, and, and I'll have to attend that. But I, I did agree to give anybody an opportunity if anybody has any questions or any uh, statements. Sometimes people rather make a statement than ask a question or any fights or foot races they want to run, uh, now's your opportunity. I, I do not know the answer to that in dollars. So there are plenty of economists in the room, and they may know that. I know that the tax increase last time was the largest tax increase in the history. They talked about tax increase this time, which has not come yet, not bad, is roughly 25% of that. So you're not getting back any, anywhere remotely close to where it went up. So even if we get the tax reduction, it will be only 25% of the tax increase, but we haven't gotten that yet. That's correct. Correct. Yes, sir. What can we do as individuals in our own communities to? Good question. I don't know if you heard it or not. It says, what can we do as individuals in our own communities to make a difference? Get involved politically. Understand what made this nation great and the principles that we were founded on. Understand what limited government is really all about and individual personal freedoms and a free market economy and what it does. And support an organization called Georgia Public Policy Foundation. They can make a difference in our state. Thank you very much. You did that just like I asked you to. <laughs> yes, sir. Would you favor the elimination of any sort of uh, tax preferential treatment that's given to the business community? Yes. Yes. Circumstances change, times change, principles do not change. And subsidies always uh, increase inefficiencies. And a subsidy to the business is just as wrong as a subsidy to anybody else. And it needs to be changed. The income tax, we spend all our time arguing about what income is. And uh, it, you can't have civilization without rules. You can't have rules without government, and you cannot have government without taxes. You're going to have to have taxes. But we need taxes in the form of a transaction tax so that when a foreign automobile is so just as much money goes to the U.S. Treasury as when a domestic automobile is. And it's not that way on the system today. The income tax is wrong because you spend all your time arguing about what income is. Whereas a transaction happens, it's tax right now. You've got to have taxes. And we're going to have to. There are better ways of doing it than we than the so-called income tax. Yes, sir. Based on the interest in limited terms, one of the problems you have with limited terms is who the hell does it take the place of politicians? So my question, very simply, is: Would you be willing to spend four years in Congress? Yes. 
the question is, this thing on limited terms, uh, the argument against term limitation is if you limit the, the elected officials, the bureaucracy will run the place. Well, in the original days, <clears throat> the Greeks who started this thing called democracy, they would not let anybody be eligible for re-election except two offices, the commanding general of the army and the, uh, the uh, uh, builder of the ships. There was a learning curve problem there that they had to worry about. Everybody else, all the, the legislators and the magistrates, they were, they were not expected to bring any expertise. They were supposed to be representatives of the people. They came, they served one year, they met, passed laws based on the best interests of the, uh, of, of the people, and then they went home and lived under those laws that they passed. Now, if you had that again where responsible citizens would run for office rather than career professional politicians, they would serve their time and go home and live under those laws, then <clears throat> they would be responsible for policy. The bureaucracy always implements policy, but the elected officials always control the purse strings, and you can always get control of the bureaucracy that way. And uh, the second half is the question, would I be willing to serve four years and go home? Yes, when my career at Flowers Industries is over, I will. <laughs> yes, ma'am. In terms of um, sending my, the money back to the state, in which Mr. Gingrich hopes to do by way of the community block grant, uh, the state has a, has a formula, has a policy to say which strategies will employ, be employed to, do, to, to change the, man, the mindset of people in local communities. What type of things does the business community wish to implement so that the mentality of everybody who exists in the social welfare state, which the United States is, changes? What type of structures do you see need to be created? That is a very good question. Changing this mindset is difficult. When Moses led the people out of bondage in Egypt, he, he could have walked to the promised land in two weeks, but it took him 38 years to get there because he had to get them out there and change their mindset. You will recall they missed the flesh pots of Egypt and the sweet cucumbers, and they wanted to go back. And he had to let them wander around for 38 years, and there were only two people living when they got there to the promised land. We've got to change the mindset. Now you ask, what is the structure? It comes back to this gentleman's question. It needs to be structured, not what the business community wants, or that segment of this thing. It's what's in the best interest of all of the people of the state of Georgia. And I submit to you that it is not subsidizing inefficiency, whether it's an individual or whether it's corporate structure. It is getting the incentives of entrepreneurship. It is subsidizing people to work. There's only one formula for prosperity. I don't care whether you're an individual whether you're a corporate structure like Flowers Industries or whether you're a nation like the United States of America. You must work, you must save some of what you earn, and you must invest it wisely. Out of that investment comes those increases in productivity, and out of that comes your increases in standard of living. So what we need to do is change the mindset of from yesteryear because it won't get the job done. It will not allow us to be competitive with the people we're going to have to compete with in the future. We're going to need incentives to work, incentives to invest. We need the factories and to train the workers to compete in a tough world. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Elected officials, you mentioned uh, there are some concerns you have with elected officials in the state of Georgia. What kind of criteria would you use to reelect or elect new officials or people in the state house? Representatives of the questions to ask them or criteria. Of, okay, if you want to run for office, do you meet, meet this criteria based on? First of all, they should be. The question was, who should we support? And they, when they run for office, we should support representatives of the people as opposed to career professional politicians, on both sides of the aisle, and. We should be involved in politics enough to know. You know, we get we have these campaigns that says go vote. I don't, I don't, that doesn't appeal to me. I'd rather we said get informed and then go vote. Know who you're voting for and what you're voting for, what this individual stand for, and then hold them accountable. And I believe that's changing. George Bush said, read my lips, no new taxes, and then raise taxes. 
and the American people held him accountable and voted him out, and I think correctly so. We should make them commit what they stand for and then hold them accountable. Yes, sir. Dave? Do you have any concern about uh, our ability to handle at the state level the return of funds back to us in terms of block grants? I, I really do. Uh, the question is, do I have any concerns about <clears throat> our state legislature being able to handle all these break, <laughs> block grants? Well, yes, our state legislature and every other state legislature is out there. I think if we go about it business as usual, we, we, will, we, will, we will not achieve the potential that we've got to achieve. We, are, we, we the people, are going to have to insist that it's not business as usual, that we do re-engineer, rethink, and we do have the incentives of entrepreneurship going forward to get all of the citizens, not the can-nots, but the will-nots, all of them, productive into the workforce and uh, making a contribution and standing on their own individual responsibilities as opposed to other things. It's a very good question and a, a large concern, and I don't know how well we'll handle it, but I consider it a real opportunity. We, we, things can be different going forward than they have been in the past. Well, thank you again very much for your time.